Hi, Wally Nichols with the Asset Guidance Group weekly update for the week ending April the 9th, 2021. I thought I'd get into this week a discussion about how the national debt may be impacting our investments and the markets as we move forward. Let's get into it. So then the thesis of this week's discussion being, does the national debt matter? This is from the uh, Committee for ResponsibleFederalBudget.org. It's a nonprofit organization out of the District of Columbia that uh, <clears throat> preaches uh, uh, against the continued spending and, and the impact that this, uh, the, the, the federal uh, deficit is going to have. These data, they, they derive these charts based off the Congressional Budget Office, the CBO. So uh, this is fairly recent, and so this is uh, probably done last year in 2020. Uh, they didn't quite have uh, uh, all of the, I, 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 here's what they did. I, I take it back. This was this year just before, so this was in March, just before they knew that they were actually going to get the, uh, the, the stimulus package, uh, Biden stimulus package passed moved on. <clears throat> they were looking at it with the House bill. Anyway, you're seeing this debt ballooning here with the rescue plans extensions and, and the extensions they're talking about here is whether or not the, the tax care credit for child care, tax credits for child care are extended and if they are extended, are they paid for or not by offsets? And so the top line is no, they're not. And then the middle line is uh, yeah, they are. And then, uh, you know, so that's, that's what's going on here. I, I think the more important uh, point for our purposes here is that as we've talked in the past in other presentations about tax rate increases, look here at the inflection point. And what you really see here is what pretty much what we've been talking about in these other presentations. Uh, the, it looks like the best data we have shows an inflection point from 2026 and beyond. And it's certainly at the end of this decade, going into the next, you really see um, uh, 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 momentum picking up in that direction. This slide is a little bit easier to see, uh, and this is in comparison, both of those were in comparison to uh, GDP gross domestic product. So now we're looking at a percentage of GDP, and it's easier to see on this chart right here, but uh, the long term versus the uh, uh, alternate scenario, the alternate scenario again being those uh, offsets, whether the offsets are provided, but you see Toward 2026 really being the inflection point, and then the later part of this decade, going into the 2030s, really picks up momentum uh, headed for the stratosphere there uh, in terms of uh, the, the deficit versus GDP. Here's a look. Uh, uh, that was versus, um, I'm sorry, let me, let me back that up. <clears throat> this was the national debt on here. Now let's go to the budget. All right. I didn't want to miss a uh, confusion there. The, the budget deficit here. And we see the same type of scenario. So we see this real big spike here uh, following the financial crisis and then following the COVID crisis. <laughs> if this was like a stock chart, we'd want to be charting that and say, okay, we're going almost here for another breakout. So just about the time we get one handled, uh, here comes another one. Anyway, uh, you see the, the, um, uh, the deficit as a percentage of GDP, again, taking off and again, very highly influenced about whether or not they pay for some of these credits that they're extending uh, with, a, with some sort of a revenue income offset on that. But a point for our purposes, again, is that it's the latter part of this decade and then the 2030s is where that thing really, really starts to skyrocket. And that's the discussion. So let's look then a little bit closer at the actual budget, all right? And you see right now, this is from the CBO, right now, net interest is consuming the huge part of it. It's $300 billion in just interest. And this is at record low interest rates. So if interest rates start creeping up, yeah, we get inflation, the interest starts taking up, it gets, gets kind of interesting here. Uh, and then you see the next, the, the breakdown is, as we go, as we go down. So um, that is the problem. Now there's this guy, uh, he's a PhD, uh, Dr. John Rutledge. He really came into his own in part of the Reagan years, uh, in, the, in the, excuse me, in the 80s, uh, when he developed uh, the Reagan uh, economic plan, and then also uh, carried over into the Bush years. Since then, he's become really the expert. He's on CNBC quite frequently. He's getting older now, obviously, but he's still on CBC as a contributor. And um, 
uh, he has taken economics, a dismal science, uh, admittedly, and, and, and tried to apply uh, thermodynamics. Uh, it's like an engineer or a physicist. He loves to apply the laws of thermodynamics against economics. And so he's, he's stretching this in here and he's saying, he's saying, how can we bring certain pieces into, into the equation <clears throat> such that it, it, it creates equilibrium in the economy here. And what he's saying with this chart, he was saying that right now we're, we're going to harvest fully valued assets. His, his, this is his advice to investors. Reduce leverage, raise cash, and then you protect your portfolio because at some point, uh, at some point this, this bull market ends because we've reached full value in terms of how much earnings, corporate earnings after the reopening can support these higher price levels. And then you get ready for the sell uh, of distressed assets. So think back 100 years ago and fast forward here 90 years. And, uh, and, and that's kind of what he's talking about doing here. And, and then being in a position here to buy uh, from forced sellers and then buy and grow top quality assets. And then he's saying that the difference is uh, people that do that and, and the economy then is, is the, the comparison ultimately is from the failed network output into the potential output of what those assets could really do. So he's looking for a correction later on. Here he's graphing it out earlier than most people are seeing it right now. We're quantitative people. This is a this is a dream that he put down together. He's a very smart guy. He's really the expert on China, and he last year really had a lot of interesting things to say about China. It's a, it, it's extremely interesting when it comes into the political realm of you know a lot of people blamed China for the COVID nineteen outbreak and whatnot. But he really last year went in and said, look at the injury that the Chinese economy took out of this. So it was, uh, even if it happened out of the Wuhan lab, uh, according to this man, uh, and he's very, 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 very intelligent on China and very much invested and in, 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 in tune with, with that dynamic, uh, it said that it they were really slicing their nose off to spite their face if that's what happened. If it was an intentional thing to inflict on the world, they paid a heavier price really than, than probably the United States did. So that's a different topic, different discussion, but this is him. And I'm throwing this up here from a post that he did on his blog in 2009. So in 2009, what he was really talking about then was the coming out, same kind of theory, thermodynamics and all that stuff, same kind of theory coming out of the financial crisis. And his point though, is well taken, and and and, and Kevin Cook, he's a, 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 a an extremely intelligent resource out of uh, Zach's investment research uh, program, kind of brought this up. And when you go back and look later on, it, it, it's intriguing what Rutledge had to say, and um, what he said was, look at the total wealth as opposed to GDP, the total wealth of a nation. And does it really make sense? Okay, what is GDP really telling us? And really, uh, it, it seems to be a hangover from virtually the, at least the early parts of the 20th century, if not from the 19th century, uh, in, in the industrial economy. We're in a, technolog a technological economy now. Technology runs everything. Uh, <clears throat> and I, let me get ahead of the slide here. His point is GDP is one thing, but the national wealth, GDP we measure, we measure, we measure. And I, everything that we've done up to this point has been as a percentage of GDP. And that's the fear that everybody has. But if you look at the GDP in terms of the nation's wealth or vice versa, the nation's wealth, and this is out of 2016, and it's hard to get a grip on what the nation's wealth really is. This is an attempt out of 2016, and it says right there, it needs to be updated. Uh, almost $270 trillion then, which was 1,576% of GDP. So if we're worried about all those deficit spending being, you know, 106% being the most that it's ever been, and that was in 1946 after World War II, 
paying for the Manhattan Project and the Marshall Plan and rebuilding the world, you know, that became, created the American empire as we've all lived in it in our lifetimes. 270 trillion, and this was five years ago, and probably now well over 300 trillion. If, if GDP is even down from then, and actually it's probably up, uh, but I mean, and we're talking about thousands of percent of the wealth on top of the GDP. So interesting concept here of what are we afraid, okay? So I said, well, let's look a bit further then. And so went into the Federal Reserve and said, well, <laughs> it's easy to get a grip on, on corporate worth, well, Wall Street, all of that stuff's well documented. What about just the, the, the uh, private sector as it were, not, not just public corporations and all that stuff? So they, they publish nonprofit organizations. This is nonprofits of almost 10 trillion, wow. And then the, uh, the household wealth of, of, of private citizens, almost 120 trillion. So we've got almost 130 trillion right there. And if you talk that on top of all of the corporate wealth and all the wealth, you know, we probably are around $300 trillion. And so Twitter and Elon Musk and Kathy Wood come into play. So on April 5th, they were having a, a, a conversation. Elon reached out to Kathy Wood and says, what do you think of the unusually high ratio of S&P market cap to GDP? And Kathy Wood is, is, is extremely, she's, she's known right now, she built ARK, okay, ARK Investment. And ARK Invest is, is, is their handle on Twitter. But <clears throat> they've done very well Although lately, with the with the the transition came back out, and she takes a lot of heat on on, on places like Morningstar. I've seen them really uh, really uh, jab her uh, about being out of touch, but she's also made uh, a, that fund uh, a really a lot of money by focusing on tech, and she makes the point here that GDP statistics evolved during the industrial age. Don't seem to be keeping up with the inter with the digital age. And the digital age has brought about productivity. And real GDP growth is probably higher and inflation probably lower than what our traditional statistics are being reported. And so she's saying quality of earnings has increased significantly. Earnings as, as reported in the S&P 500. And so she also says, look, because of disruptive innovation and good deflation, what she's speaking about there that's evolving today is the productivity has increased exponentially. And in the meantime, the costs, now what, is, what are profits? What are profits? Profits are marginal increases of revenue on top of costs. <clears throat> Excuse me, and, and, and so if costs are decreasing because of technology, and they are, microcomputers, microchips and everything. I mean, I'm doing stuff like this. There, there's no way that I could do this without a team of five to 10 people, even 10 years ago. But I do a whole lot because I'm, I'm very technologically astute as it were, uh, not to brag, but I mean, I've just always been in this thing and that's how I've kept costs low throughout my entire career <clears throat> uh, as, as, a, as a servant agent of, of, of a boutique to, to private citizens, private, families. And so uh, I know so the, that that cost continued to decrease and productivity continues to increase. I'm doing the work of at least probably five to 10 people. And it's simply because of the technology. And so what that's doing is driving costs continually down. And she makes a very, very valid point here that we're probably not getting a real GDP figure in terms of uh, to measure this against. But the massive disruption of all of this new technology that's coming in, we've got robotics that's coming in tremendously here. Um, she makes a point and says companies that didn't innovate and leveraged up to buy back stock, to distribute dividends, to satisfy short-term shareholders are probably going to pay a steep price. They're going to have to cut prices to move aging inventory and service debt. That's bad deflation. She's talking about good deflation is the overall cost of providing services because of the use of the new technology. So it's quite the point that says 
Maybe we've been used, maybe it's time to think outside the box. I should have put another slide in here that said, think outside the box. Maybe, maybe we need to think outside the box, but instead of just hanging on to these old concepts that have been around for a hundred uh, years and, and, and analyzing this new era when we're sending people, robots to Mars and sending back pictures and sending electronic cars to space to fly into the sun and having rocket ships land themselves. And then all of this, just the really workaday stuff that I'm able to use now to track the markets to make you money. Um, maybe, maybe it's something to consider. So maybe we got to think again about how we're analyzing the deficit spending, how we're analyzing the national debt. And as we go forward, well, I guess one thing's for sure, if you didn't get anything else out of this presentation, something's going to change in the latter half of this decade and going into the 2030s that we're going to have to deal with one way or the other. Until then, we take a quantitative approach and we trade to markets that are not what we think might be or what we're afraid might turn into. All right. I'll see you next week.